put them up on the website late later on. So uh, it's handy for people to be able to watch. Sometimes things life life intervenes, right? You can't always make the meeting. You can't always stay for the entire thing. So if you want to, uh, you can go back and, and take a look at it. So it'll there. I'm going to get started with a few simple announcements. Um, this is the 13th consecutive monthly program we've had since we restarted the club last July. So Terry Burnside is on. Terry was the first speaker of the July program. But uh, we plan to continue these, these monthly programs, except for August. So August will be a non-Zoom event. It's our first attempt to do a face-to-face -face anything. And it'll be a picnic, potluck, barbecue, with three demonstrations from roughly 10 to 2 in a the best park I could find, which is my backyard. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's a big backyard and it, it allows us to, to be distant and safe. And so far about 20 people have signed up, not including some spouses and partners. So if you are inclined, uh, please, please sign up. And it, you know, you can choose to stay for the entire time. Diana Larrabee who is also on this call is going to do a demonstration on her passion for greenwood woodworking uh, and preparation actually for doing some more work on, on that topic later on that she'll coordinate probably after the holidays. Terry Burnside's gonna do a demo on wood spirits and Santa Clauses and things related to holiday gift making. These will be short. And then we think Masa Natani will be in town. Masa is one of our expert teachers and he does some masterful work. And he said he would come if he doesn't have to go back to Japan. Uh, and he'll do a demonstration on texturing. And it's uh, just really masterful. So it'll be, we'll, the club will provide standard hamburger, hot dog, veggie burger, drinks, mixing, you not uh, uh, fra with that. But then based on your alphabet, you can take a look at the website when you're registered, bring a dessert or a salad kind of things. Um, we will, in the fall, we're planning on doing, we're, 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 we would really like to get back face to face. And sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Part of it depends on instructors being willing to teach, space being available, those kind of things. But we're assuming going forward as a club that we will do hybrid teaching, which means that classes will simultaneously be available most of the time, both in person and online at the same time. So you can choose. That's a dream and a wish and a hope. And we're gonna to try to prove that it works. Uh, I'm doing some experimentation now with this current Max Sutter class that I've got, but it'll be formally offered in the mid-September version of it where people can uh, you know, drop in sometimes and stay home if they want and, and try to mix and mash that way. Um, we got three nominal topics for the fall. So August is the picnic. September is a program that Terry Burnside is gonna coordinate. And September is nicely three months before December. And for those of us that are trying to make holiday gifts on December 1st, realizing it takes two weeks to get something just to dry, uh, it's a little late to get started. So the idea is to jumpstart some of the thinking and idea making in September so that you know we have a little bit of time to, to make stuff. Uh, he'll show some examples from his work. And, uh, and we have a, a class that he's also will post uh the wood burning is pyrography and you know people wow well, wood burning that's not carving well it turns out pyrography is really important to carving and uh we are roger is trying to uh, find he's, he's got an expert in texas who's a, a wood turner and a wood burner and does really a, a, an excellent job and her topic is going to be texturing with pyrography and whether you're texturing things that are turned on a lathe or texturing parts of stuff that you carve, 
it becomes becomes a central issue. And a way to think about it is it's, it's another mm-hmm. hole in which to pour money. Uh, so that when you think about you need one, you can go buy one and what do you buy and you know, how many different tips do you need, et cetera. But it's also the kind of thing that we're, we'd like to invest in for our ultimate carving studio is to have one that you can lo- you can borrow in a tool library. So you can try something out before you actually have to go buy one. And then the November program we think will work will, to be a little bit de- to be determined that Jeff Harness will teach a class, again, a program on Zoom on painting with oils. He did a two session program in May that's recorded on painting with a, painting carvings with acrylics. And he said it's a little early to get, get that committed since he's kind of retired, but he, we, think it'll, we think it'll work. So we're hoping that, that uh, that'll be in November. Um, thank you for those of you that participate, however you participate, whether you're a member or not a member. If you are a member, thank you. If you're not a member, please consider it. Uh, you don't have to be a member. We're happy to have you kick the tires and try things out. Um, we are the Oregon Carvers Guild, but we are also the carving special interest group of the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers, which is a sister club, which has o- pretty substantial overlap in membership. The Oregon, the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers tends to do furniture making kind of things that whereas the carver's world tends to be quite a lot more diversified. So that's the end of my announcement. So So I'll I'll ask you to mute your microphones. Uh, As you go along, if not, I will Mm. will use my my command and control and uh, and try to do it that way. Uh, The club is doing well, we, you know, last June, we had, there were 15 members on the rolls of so most of those, about half of those were inactive. Uh, of those 15, eight joined the club. Uh, so that became, you know, over the year, that became part of the nucleus. Tony Rizzuto, who is here in the bright red shirt, you can make, see him on the, your screen, maybe not, was the former president of the Western Woodcarvers Association and probably, and I think the longest serving executive in any in any capacity in any role for the for the uh, western woodcarvers association but we now have 60 60 members on the role some of the few of those are complimentary so we made jeff harness and gil drake complimentary and there'll be others you know that, that the instructors we do want to make complimentary but there's roughly 50 55 paid members and we don't have a lot of need for cash but we do have some because we have to start getting insurance when we get back face to face. We have to start paying for rentals. Uh, some of the classes will make money, some will lose money. Um, but uh, if you can join, that'd be great. If you wanna make a pre will donation, that's great too. So tonight's program was an experiment. We don't, I didn't know if anybody would sign up for doing, a sh- doing their uh, show and tell, but we have 15 people. So we're gonna zoom through those. Um, I'm going to just kickstart this and talk about Max Sutter briefly. Max Sutter is a probably the most influential person in the history of carving in Oregon. He was one of the few co-founders of the Western Woodcarvers Association in 1973. And at that time, he'd already been carving about 30 years. And he ended up teaching two to three classes a week for, the, until, for most of the 80s, the 70s and 80s. He had massive number of students and some of those became instructors. Um, and he was a deputy director for Bonneville Power Administration up here. He had a life, he had kids. John Sutter was one of them. John is a big benefactor for us and has inherited all of his dad's stuff. And that means uh, 50 deep relief floral carvings that we have in our in our temporary pos- possession. And we are going to photograph those and turn them into a PDF. Uh, you should be on your screen. You should see a an image, I'm hoping. 
Can you see that? Yep. Kathy, you can see that? Okay. So this is, I, I got three examples. Uh, this is photography in my, with some decent lighting in my bedroom. We're looking for someone that's got photography skills. We want to take three to five photos of each of these 50 carvings and put them in a format where they can be put on, accessible on a website for the world. Max Sutter had two books published by Dover Prints on some of these, some of them ended up in chip chats. But this is deep relief. Some people carve birds, some people carve fish, some people carve mammals. He carved flowers and I can't believe that he carved these things. So that's a front view of, I don't even remember what the flower was, but it starts showing you what the, the depth of the, the relief was. And some of these things are so fragile, I can't believe that they didn't fall apart when they carved them. And let's see now what's going to happen here. There we go. Um, so I try to show an angular view to get some of the, the deep undercutting. Um, and some of these are, are, are just really amazing. Um, he... Dover printed two books of 20 carvings each, but didn't want to print a third. So Chip Chats magazine serialized another 33 of these in monthly, in monthly issues. Some of the carvings have been dispersed to the four winds, but the others are not. So that's one heritage that Max Sutter left behind. Another is the class examples that you'll see with some of the students here that are doing show and tell. He had nominally 12 different relief carving patterns that were kind of a, a series of progressive exercises that um, allowed people who had no exposure to carving to, to, uh, to get involved and, and march up that chain. And now I'm gonna, after I get done talking, you'll be next. So I'll, I'll cue you up in a minute, just to kind of alert you. Um, uh, we also have those, that's a second contribution. The third contribution is that Max charged for his classes, but he reinvested all the money that he made into tools. And all those tools were sitting in his garage, which became his son's garage, which now is in my garage, which becomes ours as a club. He added it up, there's a thousand tools in that kit. There's about 200 Swiss made and uh, Henry Taylor long handle gouges, there's about 500 short handle Ramblesons, and there's um, 250 mid-sized Ramblesons. So these will get packaged up, loaned out as kits, part of a tool library. Some may eventually get sold that we just can't use. But Mac invented two different sets of specialty tools that Ramblesons made in order to do the deep, the deep undercutting. So let me figure out how to get out of this here. Okay, Al, I'm gonna cue you up. Let's see if we can get going here. And Al, at the, Al you'll set the prototype in an email. Just kind of introduce yourself briefly so people can kind of calibrate where you are living and kind of your experience. Hang on just a minute. Okay, I'm gonna see if I, this is, Al, this is your starting slide. So why don't you go ahead and uh, take it from here. And then when you're done introducing yourself, I'll sequence you through the slides. Mm. But make sure you're unmuted. Al, are you there? So oh, sorry, let me unmute. Uh, I'm Al Klaas. I, I uh, retired in 2002 from the fire department and I always had a, a, a desire to uh, carve. In our, um, oh, come on, on our fair, uh, there was always a carving booth from the Channel Island Carvers and I always was just intrigued by that and really wanted to uh, 
join them. And so I fortunately had a firefighter friend who uh, was in the club and um, I joined and, and I've held positions of secretary, which is really not my forte, but I did it. And uh, vice president and president and back to vice president now. Uh, and so the, uh, I enjoy carving a lot. It just uh, it blows me away why I like it so much. Anyway, this carving is a labor of love. My grandson was is in the Navy and he was on this US as Louisville, which has now be, been decommissioned, but he got to sail around the world. But anyway, uh, if you, uh, oh, go away. Uh, okay, the, um, uh, the challenges was here in the, uh, making that car that looked like frothy uh, water as, as the, the sub is diving down into the water. Mm -hmm. So the, the other challenges on this were the uh, raised letters. Uh, I did have to use some glue, some uh, CA glue on the on some of them. I think you can see them maybe in the bed. I don't know where they are, but um, this is going to be interesting to paint. So I'm, I'm real close to painting. I have to do some background cleanup behind the uh, uh, the sail there of, of the. Um, of this, and I use, by the way, I use Dockyard for some of this stuff. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Dockyard, it's a mini uh, tool, and it really takes uh, really takes to, um, you know, I could use it for inside these letters, which was a hard way to go to raise these letters that that much, and um, so the, these little tools really help. And then along the side of the horseshoe there. There's, and I just copied uh, the uh, uh, picture that my grandson sent me. And so that was, that's some challenging areas. Anyway, this was a labor of love and I'm just about done. Oh, and here, oh. and here that, that one in the middle is the first relief carving I did. And I really liked that. And I had the same issues with the uh, tall uh, fronds or grass there is having tools small enough to get on the sides. And, and I bought some dog legs to get in there and work on this. And uh, I undercut this, it, it, um, and that's Purple Heart around the edge, uh, which as Purple Heart as it ages, it gets more brown. But um, I, I had a person beg me for months to, to do this. And finally I did for a husband who was in his eighties and having his birthday. So it, it's, Stand it up. Uh, I like that. It was it was simple and, and it's a great design. It's out of a book. Then the car the oh done with that. okay. okay. <laughs> well, the bark carvings. I, I just uh, read the books. Uh, is it Hanson? And I did tried a little bit of everything on the one on the left, and I tried to make this guy uh, looking up, but I didn't have the skills to do that on the right. Looking up uh, like and having hair. Who's in my hair? Anyway, that bark carving is a lot of fun. And by the way, in bark carving, the um, burner really comes in handy because bark carvings will crumble and you can use a burner, a, a knife, and you can uh, like like around the windows and stuff, you can uh, in the, put that in and it won't crumble on you. So it's an ex ex excellent tool. Now this was the first Mac setter and this was a great challenge and this is, Okay, <laughs> a great oh. challenge in grain changing. And I tried to use the five tools for, for I think the first first three and then on, this, on the fourth one I did, I, I changed, I finally just got whatever tools I had. But this, uh, it looks simple, but uh, you know, grain is changing all the time. This one was a fun one to uh, figure out how deep to go. And, and uh, uh, this was a lot of fun to do and challenging. All, all of these are challenging, and this this is called a diaper. Um, pro, um, come on, pattern uh, design. Thank you. Yeah, with buttons, so I'd never done that. So that that was fun to do. Yeah, I like that. And then this this one is another kind of a fussy one, like the uh, sub, the uh, submarine. So uh, uh, it's not finished by any any chance, but. Uh, it's getting there, so uh, I like that. It was a great challenge, and then this was uh, something that Larry had us do, and I really like this. 
is uh, you have grain transitions when you're, when you're doing this. And of course your tool on one side is going with the grain, the other side is going against the grain. And so I tried in the center, I think I had a smaller tool and then the outer outer edge, I went with a bigger number nine, probably a, a, a 915. And uh, that works better. And I've, I, you know, I've known for a long time that, that people say use the biggest tool possible. Well, this one, that particular project helped me realize that that, that was the way to go. We call that a ripple. Okay, I like that, a ripple. And that's, and that's the end of it for Al. So Al, I won't take questions. Fred, I'm gonna have you go up next. Um, let me, I'll get you queued up in a minute. You'll see some repetition here. The, the Max Sutter relief carving class has normally 12 patterns. The first three is really what the classes are focusing in on now and you'll see repetition. And the only purpose for showing repetition is to show you that not everybody finishes that. In fact, most people don't finish the patterns. And so it becomes um, uh, an exercise in how much time you can uh, you can spend. So Fred, hang on just a second. Okay, Fred, that's yours. So, so I'm starting you out on your, your Max Sutter uh, things as well. I'll just start. This is your, your eternal knot version. Okay. Can you see that, Fred? Can you nod your head? If you My name? That? Yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, I yourself. see that. My, my yeah. name is Fred. My name is Fred Lu. I uh, belong to uh, the Santa Clara Coffin Club, chapter number one. I've been with them for about all their websites, and I, I went into the, their, their, their room, and everybody was so busy, and and I, I said, may I visit you? And nobody answered. And I yell. And then finally, they, some <laughs> answer. And they said, oh, yeah, you can join us. So I've been with them for about uh, three years. And that uh, I'm very interested in uh, relief carving. And uh, because uh, I'm interested in the Chinese character carving and uses either insight or relief. So, so I, I heard about this. Yeah. Uh, from Larry about this club. So I joined it and this is my carving from uh, the class. Yeah. Well, this is Fred's interpretation of the diaper pattern and that's Max Sutter's yeah, this, invention. A, Basically was he gave the people the diamond, the diamond outline and said, you go figure it out. So not everybody had time to figure it out, but a lot of people did and they can interpret uh, small and big diamonds and this is the third the third project the tulip project which is a begin that started to introduce uh curves and you saw this one with al this is the uh this is what max Sutter called project number four it's actually the beginning of relief carving where you lowered the background and started creating some contours of the uh the floral arrangements but Fred went on. He went more. He did more. Was this challenging for you, Fred? This is the lily, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go on. Wow. This wow. Is... So that, that came out of a Sayers book that Max Sutter copied out of... Uh, um, anyway. But this is this uh, quite a number of the patterns are floral, and Fred jumped into the floral ones. This is a, a rose, Fred. Yeah, this is. Mm -hmm. And so okay. there's you. You got some tools you'll show in a minute about this one. The challenge on this was what the uh, the the petals in the middle, not the petals, but the uh, the, the center part of yeah. the flower. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the upper two flower heads uh, use a punch. 
No, this is the next 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 slide is the punch. The low the lower two uh, flower head is using this this uh, uh, drill. The upper one is using a punch. I yeah, this is the punch, and I heard about Sutter says something about how to make this punch. There's a nail in the middle coming up and ground it into a, a square or a rectangle and then and then uh, put a send a punch on it and drill the hole in the middle and uh, the dime shows the relative size of the the, the nail and the length the, the nail is about that long so it gives you the idea what it makes so I use the punch to punch the, the flower heads on the upper two flower heads, okay. the upper two one. And the they lower two both, is... Both, yeah. both techniques, okay. And this is a, a, a stool uh, I made for myself that the, that the center three figures uh, are a Chinese origin and it's... Uh, is a uh, uh, what do you call that uh, silver uh, lay and trace out the Chinese word called the, from the from the left to the right. It is the word is knowing when to stop, and the center is a Tai Chi uh, picture, okay. and uh, the flower is a line carving by, uh, by one of the, uh, the, the, the Sutter, uh, number 17, I believe. So okay. I, uh, I, I, I did, uh, uh, what do you call it, stain it, and it, it didn't turn out <laughs> too good, so I painted it instead. Okay, and what is the turtle is? Uh... It's a turtle that I copy from a, uh, 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 a uh, turtle I had. Okay. And this is a shoe. This is my toe, and uh, I copy it from from my toe. And this is a. I as I mentioned, that I love to to know to to learn how to do uh, inside coughing and relief coughing. So this is the reason I wanted to, to take the class. So. The top picture. Well, the top picture shows oh, shows that it says it says brave but no brain. Then the lower one happened to be a, a, what Lao Tzu said something. And if you zoom in now below, there's the translation in English. Is that those who do not know. He's referring to Zen or Tao. And Tao is something that you can't really talk about. It, you have to act it out. So that's what it's all about. This is, a, I'm trying to combine. A, oh, this is, a, this is, I'm trying to combine the, the relief and, and also the insights into one. So I'm not very successful, but but nevertheless, it is what he said, trying to, trying to do. This is a, a, a relief uh, uh, carving. It's coming from the right to the left. And it's a poem uh, uh, written somewhere around about 10 AD. And the guy is not very uh, sour grape and he's not very well known. So he, he said, uh, I have a symbol clothing keep me warm and uh, uh, and, and, and a vegetable soup is tasty and so forth. And all I want is to read my books. Ah. Okay, Fred, I'm gonna move on. Uh, Jerry Boone, I'm gonna okay. have you go next. I'm trying to see if, um, if Brian is here, I have to look. I can't see everybody on the screen. I don't see Brian. Uh, so Jerry Boone, I'll queue you up. Go 
while he's doing that, um, I've been carving for about 10 years. Uh, started in Hemet, California. My wife and I are, uh, are snowbirds. We go south every year. And uh, the Hemet Carving Club um, had weekly meetings in the RV park that we were at. And uh, just on a whim, I uh, took the class and just really fell in love with it. So this is one that I did last summer, and the idea is. Oh, I'm, going back to, I'm going to go back to Hemet. I'm going to start with you here. Oh, okay. Right? All right. Yeah. When I when I went to Hemet, this was the first this was the first carving project I ever did, and it's supposed to be a long neck goose. And um, when you walked into the into the club meeting um, for ten dollars, they gave you a piece of wood that was nominally cut out and a knife and an instructor that um, kind of walked you through it. And, you know, frankly, after about the first 10 minutes sitting there with the knife and the piece of wood, I was, I was hooked. And that's, that's been about 10 years. And I don't want to, I don't even want to think of how much money invested in tools later. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay. Um, this was uh, the result of about two summers of carving. This is uh, Nanny D. Um, she's a basically a quarter scale version of the figurehead that's on the uh, clipper ship, the Cuddy Sark, uh, in England. Um, my, both my wife and I, our, our heritage is uh, predominantly Scottish, or at least partially Scottish. Um, the uh, the Cuddy Sark was was built in Scotland. I'd seen it twice. Just kind of fell in fell in love with the ship, and um, decided that I at this point I wanted to do a um, a human figure. I wanted to do a female figure, and uh, this was a, a good way to com combine them both. It it is a glue up. It's about forty inches tall, and there's uh, thirteen pieces of basswood uh, glued together on there to uh, to make her whole. It's about 350 hours in, in that piece. Nice piece. Just yeah. so, uh, Jim Hall, after Jerry, you'll, I'll have you go next with your first batch of carvings. Wow. Okay, the, um, the little house that Larry showed uh, just a little bit ago. Um, this one that here, one. This, this I did last summer and it was kind of my interpretation of what the carving studio would look like uh, for the person who carved Nanny D. And um, inside, uh, as you can see, there's a, there's a, a, a miniature Nanny D, a carver. Um, I, I just, I had a lot of fun. There's, there's, there really isn't any, any particularly difficult carving in this piece, other than it's just a, a lot of stuff put together um, that, that I think really works quite well. This one I, I particularly like, it was, um, I think it's about the second year that I carved and this was the first piece of my own design. Um, and the first piece that I did in pierced relief, uh, basswood stained. Um, I, I, I still like this piece a lot. I've done a lot of stuff since then, but this still ends up being one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is the very first relief carving I ever did, and this was at a from a class at um, uh, Woodcraft. Uh, it was a Sunday class, you know, for fifty bucks or something, and the guy taught us how to do relief carving. And again, I, I kind of keep this one. Um, this <laughs> this is one that just kind of illustrates that you can you can pretty much carve on anything and, and a lot of found wood. I went to a, a garage sale a couple of years ago and the woman was selling a whole bunch of these wooden floats. And um, I kind of looked at them and said, you know, there must be something I can do with that. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I bought them. I kind of built a brace to hold them in and uh, started playing around with it. And at the end, I, I did about six or seven of them all with, you know, sort of nautical fishing type scenes on it. This one is, is nominally a salmon. Mm. Uh, this mm. is the green man. This is a, a lower Irish pattern. Um, it's in size, re in size relief. Um, I worked with Jeff Harness on this one. He kind of was looking over my shoulder as I did this one. 
And um, I entered this in, there's a, a huge carving show in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, and this was my last year as a novice. And it took best overall out of 400 plus entries. Um, and I, 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 there's another one that I, I still look at. I just say, you know, that came out okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And this is the last big piece that I finished. Um, nice. I started this one, uh, as I said, we, we um, were snowbirds. So I've also got a, a little carving shop down in Mesa and an eight by 10 uh, shed. And um, this one I decided to do shortly after the November election. I don't know if I was full of patriotism or what, but uh, decided I wanted to do this one. And th this one presented a lot of challenges. And you know, part of it was, um, there, obviously there's no patterns for this at all. So I ended up taking, you know, looked at a, a bunch of photos online, uh, found a couple of, of drawings. And um, one of the things I discovered as, as, as I was working on this thing is that the drawing that I was using wasn't horribly accurate. But at that point, I was pretty much stuck with what I had. Um, probably the biggest single challenge was doing the... Um, the scroll work that that forms the um, the railing, and um, that I ended up uh, basically cutting out sort of an oversized hockey puck of uh, of basswood. Uh, did some really deep relief carving into it, uh, and then I used a scroll saw to cut the inside of it out, and then put it on a on a spindle sander, and then just very very gently sanded the inside of it uh, until I got the thickness that I wanted. Uh, it was an experiment because I had no idea when I was putting on the scroll sander if it was going to work or if the whole thing was just going to blast itself into a thousand pieces. And I was lucky that it, indeed it did work. Yeah, we were, uh, Jerry wrote an article for the last newsletter that describes it shows more of the steps of this process. It's, uh, it's quite quite a piece of work. I think that's it, Jerry. Uh, just acknowledging Jerry also just finished a year on the board of directors as treasurer and leader and startup person in our board. We really thank him for that service. But he also wrote uh, a really significant article that ended up being published in Chip Chats magazine. It's a three-page article on the rebirth of the club here. And uh, Jerry, I'm not sure when you wrote that. It seemed like about six months ago. Uh, Jerry, in his professional life, was a writer for the Oregonian, so has all those skills. And we'll circulate that. If you don't get chip chats, it's a really nice story. Um, and it's, uh, it's heartwarming. So Jim Hall, I'm going to queue you up. Uh, and then Joe, Jed, I'll see Joe Jedorowski. I'll have you go after, after Jim. Someone's got to go after Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I call this Jim Hall one. So they just, Jim's got such a prolific body of work that well, I broke it into two different parts. Interesting, why is that happening? Hang on a minute. Just when you think you know computers. Oh, there we go. Almost there. Almost there, Jim. Okay. Oh, there you go. So you're going to see a series. Jim is. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, Jim, about your a little bit about your journey as a woodworker, carver, turner. Yeah, I um, <laughs> I did this as a hobby. That's all it is. And I, as a result of this, it helped save my limited mentality. Uh, I would come home from work uh, after working with uh, the many idiots that I worked with at the county and uh, 
work on uh, whatever I was working on. And uh, after I had dinner and talked to the kids and my wife, and uh, I did that for a good many years. In fact, I was looking at something today, uh, it's over 40 years. Anyway, uh, I'm basically a carver, a, a woodwork, a wood turner. Uh, most of the stuff that I've done is wood turning. And I have done that as a result of uh, not just my own work, but learning from other people. I found that uh, I didn't have the, the uh, all things uh, from everybody. I've, I have learned a great deal from a lot of people. And I found it very, very, very important. Uh, a lot of the things that I have done are uh, of my own uh, uh, shape and so on, but not all of them. Uh, some of them are things like, what in the devil is that? And uh, I've done some things that are kind of weird, but I also in, in, enjoy them. Uh, this is a piece of, uh, of uh, maple, maple that is all burl. Uh, and and I've just kind of cut around and got something out of it. That's the, uh, that, here's another piece that uh, I started off as a uh, something else that I thought was just ugly as ugly could be. And I got a hold of a guy that uh, is very, very, very good. And he and I said, if we can't figure something out, it'll make a nice bonfire. And he said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and so we uh, uh, did some things and uh, it came out, I think, pretty decent. It's uh, at least we've- so Jim, so Jim, you you turned this and then you you carved it by hand and by power or, or just by power, is that right? So Jim Jim is a big, he's, he's got both, he's got hand tools, but he also is a big fan of micromotors and Fordhams, but he's, he's in love with the NSK. You know, high-speed devices. So a lot of the work is kind of a combination of uh, mechanisms. Yeah, I have some tools that uh, run from about 36,000 to over 800,000. So uh, I get RPS. quite a different uh, picture of what, <laughs> it's not 800, it's 400,000. It's uh, their um, doctor's tools. This one right, right here was done with a what is known as a rose engine. Uh, it's a, a piece of equipment that there's only three of us in the entire state that have one. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting piece of uh, equipment. It's fun to work with, but it will also drive you nuts. Uh, so what they uh, can do. There'll be a separate program, maybe by the Northwest Tourers Group, perhaps by us. But Jim's got just a fabulous set of examples of things that he does uh, with the with the Rose engine. As you see from this picture or those pictures, uh, st standard pictures don't do much for me. Uh, I will take a piece of wood and see what else I can do with it. This is kind of like a a, a, bur a Oh, I don't know, uh, an apple maybe, or a something. Of, its leaves are opening up. It's overeat. All right. And I also, as you notice, do, do not have it sitting straight up. Uh, every once in a while, I would do one that has a bottom that is off the center. And as a result, it turns, in my opinion, something different. That's quite, works kind of, kind of neat. This is a piece of... Uh, burl, maple burl, and it is a spiral cutting around it. And it um, is a little more, quite a bit different and quite a bit more difficult to, to cut like that. But that's what it's all about. Um, is that done with the rose, Jim, is that done with the rose engine or by hand? That's all done by hand. Yeah. Every bit of it. This is a piece of maple again. Uh, I'm a great uh, follower of, 
of um, stippling around the uh, piece. Now, what the reason I do that is because it does something. It, it adds something to the to the wood. Uh, and that's all it is. It's stippling that is done with a that high speed uh, cutter, and it really, really, I think, adds a great deal to it, and I, I really enjoy it. Mm. This is another piece, as is that one. Um, that's a piece that is done by hand um, with a tool that's an air driven tool. And uh, that's just a bowl, but I use an air driven uh, tool to cut it. And I think that, I think, as is this one, this is maple. Uh, that says uh, American Elm. American Elm okay. and Coca-Cola. Coca okay. Yeah, Coca-Cola on the top and it's Elm on the bottom. Okay, very good. Thank yeah. you. You can read, I can't. I know. I got the screen <laughs> in front of me. This one is Raleigh and Ironwood. Yeah, that's from Chile. That's an interesting wood. It's a very, very, very nice wood. Um, I have a piece that I made uh, out of that that I truly love. Uh, my wife forced me net down. She, <laughs> Rowley and uh, Ironwood. It's, Is it's, that done it's, by hand as well, Jim? Mm, no, those were done with a router. With the router, interesting. How about that? How'd you do that one? That is a piece of uh, a mango. Now that is spiral turning. Uh, it's a, you're learning how to lay it out so that you can then turn it, work it by hand. It's all done by hand, except for the, the uh, piece in the very center. But all of that is, is hand work and they're kind of fun. There's another one. This is a piece that was done by in Raleigh. Um, that's the first one of the big ones I've ever done in, in uh, the spiral. Uh, we, I did that as a result of, of uh, my wife. Uh, we saw a, a gourd down in uh, uh, Arizona and she said, can you do that? And I said, well, maybe we'll see. And there it is. Now this one is uh, uh, Pacific Madrone. Pacific Madrone is a lovely word. It's a weed tree, but to work it, it is just super, super. Uh, the uh, side of it uh, is all done with a, with a, a router. Mm. The finial on that is a, um, uh, a fl uh, fire. Oh, it's ebony, ebony finial. So, yeah. 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 This is a piece of, of a red Raleigh sir, uh, sycamore and with the bamboo. And I did that one a long time ago. Um, I thought it was longer ago than that. But it's a piece that I really like. So you finished it and then carved through the finish and then yes. put gold paint on? Yes. All right. Now, this is a piece that uh, my sister has. Um, that is uh, maple leaf, maple leaves, but it's maple wood. And uh, I. I it's just a gourd going up and uh, hollowed out the interior hmm. and then uh, cut it. This one is a more com complex one. This is mine. This is my, actually, this is my wife's. Uh, I've been told that anyway. <laughs> and um, it's stuff, leaves, leaves laying on, on top of leaves designed by, by me for whatever it's worth. Hmm. So you turn the outer vessel and then yeah. you you is it carve with your rotary, with your uh, air driven tool again, or how did you carve? Yeah. How some did you was air driven, some was motor driven, electric. 
um, doing all sorts of things, yes. But mostly power, is that right? Oh, it's all power. You all bet. power. Now, this is a piece of, uh, of um, I think it's, it's, I think it is um, maple. It's a burl. So this one's here just to show that Jim is a master turner. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the amount of work, you walk through his house, it's like a museum. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite amazing. So Jim, that's the end of your part A thing, which is sort of the turnings. So Joe, as I said, Joe Jodorowsky, you, you get to follow Jim. But what's interesting about Joe and Jim is they're buddies. So they, they know each other, they hang out together. Jim has done a lot more stuff because he's been retired for about 50 years. <laughs> okay, hang on just a second. I gotta. That's an overstatement. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> hang on a minute. I gotta get myself organized here. What's going on? Hang on, Joe. I gotta. Sure. Just when you think you know your wife. Just when you think you know your computers, that they don't behave like they used to. We're gonna, here we go, we'll be okay. I'm gonna start, hang on a minute. I'm gonna go back to the beginning, okay. which is your, ta your, ta uh, your, there we go, the tang, the, the bird. Yeah, this, uh... Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit about your background? Oh, I'm Joe Jedrakowski. I'm a former teacher and uh, I moved up here in 2004. And as Al was saying, he was in the Channel Island uh, Carving Club. I was in the Channel Island Turner's Club. So we were in the booth right next to yours at those fairs. Um, I carved this one with one hand because the guy who was teaching me was holding my other hand. And he is a dedicated bird carver. And I started with a Western tanager, which is a pretty easy bird to start with. Um, we bought a life-size model that we could take measurements from, and that helped quite a bit, but the feet are not carved, they're not made. If this were entered in a competition, I would have to have made everything, including the stick that he's standing on. What's the deal with having one hand? Oh, it was a joke. Uh, oh. My instructor was holding my other hand, so I only had one hand to carve with. Mine. He was holding my hand. Okay. Ah, got it. Okay. I, I do other stuff. Uh, this is a table from a burl that was cut down about five years ago. It was sitting in the garage drying to get it down to a decent moisture content. And then I made a coffee table out of it. And this is very recent that I did this. And can I go to the next one? Uh, here is a uh, platter that I have 14, actually it's 22 karat gold leaf on and painted over it. And it's a... So. so that's a turn project as opposed to a carve project? Yes. Yep. There's a little carving in here, but... Yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, this is an early carved project. I wanted to show the four seasons with these stick trees. And the, the painting was what I wanted to do mostly. And it looks it. And this is another early project of a maple hollow form. And of course, it's not maple, it's walnut. And of course, I carved a maple leaf on it. 
go figure. This is some painting I've done. It's a piece of uh, burl, maple burl, and very simple fish design. And I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, John Harvey, I'm going to have you uh, go next, and then Leif, I'll have you go there. Uh, John is very brave. He's a new to carving. He was uh, joined into the Max Sutter class, and he was willing to share his first experience. So hang on a minute. And John, I think I chose your uh, perspective. Yeah. Oh, good, good. There we go. So, yeah, I'm three, John three Harvey, minutes. and um, I am a woodworker, at least I pretend to be. <laughs> I try to build furniture of my own designs. And um, I've been working with wood for about 12 years. And this is the first project from the Max Sutter course that Larry was teaching so this was March of this year and I discovered a lot of things about carving on this piece and one of them is that I have to learn how to carve and so um, I am not sure where I'm going to go with it and current thinking is I'm going to incorporate carvings into some of my other pieces maybe into some boxes or some furniture but um, it's very relaxing, very peaceful, and very frustrating all at the same time. So, um, yeah. and so you're living in the metro area now, but you're a transplant from Riverside, Southern California. We were in Vancouver, and we moved up here to be next to a what is now a three-year-old grandson. So it's yeah. um, it's great to be up in the area, and it's it's. Great to see your guys work. I mean, I'm just like sitting here going, oh my God, my piece is not going to stand up to this stuff. But you got to start somewhere and you, you got to start a lot somewhere. of ideas of what to do. So, and thank, thank you, you for thank you for being brave. What not said is that John's doing a lecture Thursday on um, Sam Maloof's museum and, and woodworking. He was a docent in that area and uh, it's quite familiar with it. So on, in the project build team on Thursday afternoon on Zoom, there will be a, a program that he's going to do. Is that right, John? Do I have that correct? That is correct. And uh, it's just going to be a really quick overview. And Sam, we're going to take a look at his house and then look at some of his furniture. So it will be a lot of fun. Okay. And Leif, I'll have you get started. Oop, I got to get... Um, yeah. Just unmute yourself and. I think I you can, uh, can you hear me now. Yeah. You're a little bit echoey, but you're okay. All right. Well, you know, to start with, um, uh, I've been a, a collector of Leroy Setzel's work for about 15 years. So pretty much all my carvings are inspired by his work um, uh, to, to one degree or another. This first one is uh, African mahogany. Um, it's uh, roughly oh, 18 by 18, uh, inch and a half thick. Um, uh, it's all hand carved. Um, uh, you know, it, was, it was my, I think this was my third piece I had done. But that, and I, what I tried to do on each carving is to implement a, a different design that I hadn't done before. So every, every time I do one, there's a, something new, a new element that I'm adding from a learning educational point of view. And, uh, and so far, it's all just experimental. And, and I think like we've talked about before, the wood kind of tells you what to do sometimes because it either cooperates for design or it doesn't cooperate. And so you change things along the way. But anyway, so that was, that's, this was one of my earlier ones. This one is actually my first one uh, out of uh, Black Walnut. Uh, you know, again, uh, in, inspiration by Leroy Setzel. Um, it's about two feet long, and actually it's right behind me in this, that, the dark piece behind me. It's on the wall here. Uh, you know, that was, again, learning different elements. And part of the reasons that uh, I was collecting Cecil's for about 15 years, and as I think everybody knows, they've gotten really expensive. And I got to a point thinking that, well, you know, I might be able to do something like this, that it's going to be enjoyable and, and something I can learn from. And uh, so I just started uh, carving, you know, 
inspirational sexual pieces uh, just from a collector point of view. And I basically just uh, give them to my kids or have them on the house or uh, I don't sell anything. I just, I just do it for fun. Leif, why don't you backtrack just a moment and talk about your Salishan experience and exposure to Setzel's work there and the yeah. importance of Salishan Lodge as a vehicle for his, his launch? Yeah, so Salishan, I go back into way back. Uh, uh, I've known all the general managers and the chefs there. And I'm a chef by trade and, uh, and skipping around here a little bit, I was the head of Salishan Lodge oh, for 31 true. years. Uh, and, uh, and one of the Setzels is up there too. But back back to Salisham, as everybody I think knows that uh, Setzel's major uh, commission started at Salisham for the most part with many panels, three, three dimensional sculptures and so on. So I kind of go back with that. So I kind of, you know, my kids grew up around Setzel pieces at Salisham and I just have a lot of uh, experience with that. Uh, um, so, uh, anyway, so Salishan was definitely one that, uh, you know, started me off on this for the most part. And you're currently located in the Portland metro area on the flank of Mount Hood, is that right? Yeah, I'm at uh, Welch's up by, uh, I'm at the resort at the mountain at the, in Welch's, uh, about 30 minutes from Timberline. And, and this one is one I just finished, um, and that's the one that's actually behind me. Uh, and, and this one that you're seeing is uh, before I have applied uh, uh, oil to it. Uh, so this is in this natural form. Uh, it's about five feet long, uh, about 14 inches wide and about an inch and a half thick. Uh, uh, and, and this is uh, South American mahogany. And this is laminated in, in four pieces. Uh, it started off with a four by four, uh, five foot long four by four in mahogany. And then I ripped it down to a two by two by four, and then laminated them together with biscuit joints and, and wood glue. Uh, so that's how it's attached. And then the, the outside areas, uh, I kind of consider that sap wood, although I don't know for sure that it is. In the center, again, I laminated it that way. So the white part is, you know, on either side is one piece of uh, two by four, and then two red parts in the middle are two pieces of two by fours laminated together with biscuit joints. Uh, and that's why the color variation. And most Setzel pieces were laminated for the most part. Uh, so, you know, I consider that, uh, you know, no problem to do. And Leif, are you doing things by hand, by power or mixture? Uh, you know, that's a good question. The, the first ones I started with were completely 100% by hand. Uh, and then I, along the way, I've been struggling with uh, technique versus design. Uh, so some designs I wanna do, uh, the technique by hand isn't quite as cooperative. So I've just recently used a little bit of power tools and, and the little bit of power tool I'm talking about is an Automach uh, uh, power carver. Uh, and I've been enjoying that. I've only had it for a couple of months, uh, but uh, the Automach, I'm actually very pleased with it. Uh, I do have a set of blades. Uh, I think there's like 14 blades in a set and it's, uh, you know, it's easy to use, it's effective. Uh, it does really nice work with uh, woods that tend to split or, or, or you know, check out and uh, kind of, uh, you know, fracture and so on. So it really helps control that and just uh, beating it with uh, a mallet. Uh, so I've been enjoying the auto mock, but I would say the auto mock is still the minority of the work in it. It's mostly by hand. Yeah. Is this the same, a, the same piece with different view? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the side view there was just to give you a sense of dimension. Yeah, it's, it's too bad the set the background setting is so so ugly. <laughs> that's my that's just right outside my window. Here. <laughs> I know. I, I think everybody's got envy all of a sudden. <laughs> and let's see. And this one was uh, uh, South American mahogany, and this was interesting. Uh, and I'll hold it up here. So it's just start off with the, this piece of wood here. It's a little hard to see, but a friend of mine had uh, all these four by fours. Uh, uh, of hardwood, and uh, he was. Where I was talking one day about carving, and I said, like, "Oh, what do you uh, what do you guys have here?" He goes, "Well, I have all these uh, four by four uh, posts, but I'm just using them all for firewood." So he's cutting them up into lengths and just burning them, and then, so he gave me one piece, which is this one right here, and this, this is very heavy. It's about a foot long and it weighs about ten pounds, uh, just even a foot long. So it's a very dense piece of South American mahogany. So that, that one you're looking at is I think it's 
six or seven pieces of four by fours. And this is a full four by four thickness on this particular piece. Uh, wow. uh, and so very heavy, uh, very deeply carved in the center parts and so on. Uh, but um, yeah, that was a fun one to do. But I realized that you don't need to go as thick as a four by four because that's uh, you know way thicker than you need for the uh, relief uh, for the most part. Yeah. And just a, a Roman, I'm going to have you go next after Leif and then Terry Fernside. And this one is a piece of uh, white oak. Uh, it's roughly two by two, uh, also about an inch and a half thick. And again, uh, each one of these is adding a new dimension as far as some kind of a design element that I had not tried before. So each one is a learning experience. Um, uh, you know, and, uh, and I'm, I'm kind of, there are some motifs that I like and I repeat. Uh, um, but not exactly, just, just the, you know, just the concept wise. So this one just has some, uh, you know, different things, but all these finishes are just uh, either linseed oil or vodka oil. Uh, those are the two oils, the only two that I'm actually using. And this is a piece of uh, walnut um, that is uh, roughly about two foot long and about 18 inches wide, roughly. Uh, and this one's without oil so far. Um, I ended up finishing it uh, later on, but uh, so this is a raw, raw piece. Um, uh, it's one of the ones that's more enjoyable. Uh, I have some teak that I'm going to be carving next. Uh, uh, this one is also an oak. Uh, um, and uh, again, I'm adding new elements to it. This one I actually gave to a friend of mine as a gift because he's the one that actually gave me the wood to begin with. Uh, so I thought I would treat him and uh, repay it back with the carving. Yeah, wow. And this one is uh, also South American mahogany, five feet long, foot and a half wide. Um, you know, uh, this was my third one. And this one actually I gave to my son for his house. He, uh, I had just kind of this idea that uh, as either my kid, I have four kids and as they either got married or bought a house, I would present them with a, a, a large carving for their uh, for their house for uh, from a just for a design decoration point of view. So again, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sexual inspiration, uh, the kind of a spiral sort of thing on the edge there. That was a design that I hadn't done before, so I tried that, uh, and that worked out pretty well. And uh, uh, this piece of wood cooperated pretty well. It was a little bit more on the hardwood side, so I enjoyed carving that. And another view off my deck there with a little bit of blue sky. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Super. Thank you, Leif. Thanks, sorry. Roman, I'll cue you up. Hello. Uh, my name Would is you? Roman. I live in San Jose, California for many years now, but uh, I grew up in Ukraine and Russia and was exposed to wood carving there. Just a little bit, but 30 years later, I realized I need a hobby, and that was a great opportunity to start wood carving and uh, Larry will share my projects. Does that show up? Do I have my sharing it, Roman? Not yet. Not yet. So what did I not do right? Hang on a minute. Here we go. Skip the step. That is a chip carving pattern that I came up with in 2016. I challenged myself to design pa recognizable patterns using straight chips, chips with the straight edges uh, and using classical chip carving. And that was one of the patterns that I came up with. You may, uh, you may start working on winter ornaments now in July to be ready, right? And uh, I shared these patterns um, with the public. They are free patterns. You may visit my website and uh, readandtry.com and find more patterns like that. I so really enjoy chip carving. Yeah. This is another uh, project. I turned it from basswood. The, uh, it's six inches tall. And I used the maple burl as a base. 
Uh, that was turn two with a live edge, natural edge. And that reminds me of Cliff. I called that project Lighthouse on a Cliff. The basswood piece is one piece, no glue. And it was finished with linseed oil. Also, the pattern is available on my website, readandtry.com. Thank you, Roman. So Roman's hanging out with us, uh, even though he's in San Jose, he's a member of the year's also chapter number one. And Club number five. There. Number yeah. five, okay. So there are 40 carving clubs in California organized by the California Carvers Guild. I think it, the maximum height might've been 55 clubs. I belong to one called the Central Coast Woodcarvers and Tom Bundy and, and Al and I hang out with, with them. Uh, but Terry, I'm gonna queue you up. Terry is a board member and the webmaster and the club secretary and instructor and does everything. Okay, hang on a minute. You, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Terry, and I'll, okay. I'll get your I'm, slides. I'm Terry Burnside. Um, I've been secretary of, of the club, this reorganized club since we started, and uh, um, that's an odd job for me. I'm not that kind of person. Um, I started carving some time ago uh, as relief, um, relaxation. I uh, worked in the tech industry for 40 years and um, tech sales primarily. Um, so I, I needed a little something to blow off steam with other than, uh, than beers and martinis. And uh, carving was a good thing to do. Um, it's healthy. So, Larry, I don't see anything. I see a white thing. Interesting. So, it says I'm sharing. Okay. It's weird. What's weird? Wow. Don't you love I it? I saw that first image for just a second, and then it kind of disappeared into a into a white space. Yeah. What's really curious is my Zoom has now got duplicate screens. I've never seen that before in my life. So we moved out here to Portland a couple of years ago, almost two years ago now. Time flies. From uh, Florida. I was a Florida native. I was born in, and bred there. And... Um, all our families started moving west, so we joined them a couple of years ago. I had two and a fraction of, of a new grandchild. I've got, I've got one that's on the way. She's, uh, she's due any minute, any, any time from now. There we go. There's a, I see something there, Blair. I'm going to hit the play from start. Can you see that now, Terry? I can. Okay. So if I go forward, can you see the next slide? Um, I, you, you see 1970 and your, your, your green man? No, no, no. I still see this. So PowerPoint is not... PowerPoint not cooperating? Yeah, PowerPoint's not cooperating. So rather than going so, forward, if you actually moused on that, on that next picture, would it... Um, and click that, would it bring it up? I just clicked on it. Didn't do it. Can you see Can you see the starter slide now? I can see some carvings past and present. So if I go forward, would you see anything different? I don't see anything different. Okay, so Terry, I'm gonna uh, just abort you for now. We'll try to come back. <laughs> Tom, Story of my life. No, we don't, we're not going to, we're not going to abort you. We're just going to pause you. Then Tom okay. Bundy, I'm going to see if I can. Terry, you're the only one that had a PowerPoint and it should have worked. Um, but it didn't. Well, you can, uh, after a while, if you want to come back to me, you can turn it over to me and I can try it if you'd like me to do that. Uh, that might work too. So Tom Bundy, can you see your bear? It's 
Interesting. Not yet. Not yet. What's really crazy about my computer at this moment is I'm seeing duplicate. My, uh, I got duplicate, I got two monitors. Zoom is showing up on both windows. I've never seen that before. Um, I think what it is, is I'm going to blame it on Microsoft because once I get, get out of PowerPoint, everything goes back to normal. So there is something weird in my own education about Microsoft. So we're going to come back and Tom, hang on a minute. We should be okay. I think I want to do. <laughs> Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Okay, I'm not much of a talker. <laughs> no, it's okay. Well, you got, you got big objects to show. So I think yeah, you, should okay, see, there it you, is. Should, you should see your bear. So let me get the slideshow part of it started up. And there's your bear. So why don't you talk about that project just a hair a bit? Well, it's redwood. It's uh, six feet tall by uh, not including the base by 20 inches wide. And uh, I use chainsaws and uh, and angle grinders and die grinders to uh, to do it. Cuts all grinders. And uh, can you spent... see the stump? Can you see the the, the the trunk now? Yeah. So that's what you started with. Yeah. And it's a house in uh, Central Roy California. Grandy. Yeah, it's you in California. The... Yeah. So uh, that was before and, I oiled it there. I oiled it and it got dark, so. I see scaffolding in the back. Was that a part of the process? Yeah, I got that scaffold because uh, it's up in the air eight feet. So I, I don't want to use a chainsaw over my head too much. No. <laughs> How did you, uh, did you, you said you modeled the bear before the client uh, authorized the work, is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I did it out of clay, so it, carving it out of clay several times to see what I was gonna do. And then, and I, I spent just as much time, I, I've got about 12 days in that to, at six hours a day. And, uh, but not every day was full use, but yeah. the, uh, I spent just as much time studying and, and measuring things out before I did it each, each day, each time I, I, before I'd go down each time, I'd study and uh, see what I'm gonna do and so I can measure it out and get, get as much done as I can while I'm down there. Yeah, and you said you used two different chainsaws, one with a yeah. narrow yeah. tip? Yeah, dime, dime size tip, so. That's, yeah, that's something. Yeah, I did that. I did that probably about 10, 10, 15 years ago. It's uh, well, it's got the measurements on there. So, but is that's that redwood too. Is that a chainsaw project or is that? Uh, it started off with chainsaw, yeah, and then and then grinders, but not that not the cuts all. It was just smaller. So it took a long time to do, but uh, I, I could probably do it a lot quicker now. Yeah. But it turned out okay. That was all hand tools there. That's that's the second face I did with hand tools, and that's a that's a Jeff Fair's carving. Ah. Out, out of I used his book to, to as a guide. Did, was that at a class, or did you just follow the book and do it yourself? Um, it was, uh, Dave Dignam kind of guided me a little bit. So he's one he's, of the members and leaders of your club. Yeah. And he, he can do those really good and fast. I think he could probably do that in about 20 hours. Hmm. So. so there's two different photos of the seahorse. Three yeah. actually. What's the origin of this? Um, well, I just got kind of interested in trying to carve them. Somebody showed me some people carving them, but they were really big 
back where it flooded, back back where a tornado went through back east. And I, I thought, well, I'll try that. But that's about 40 inches tall. And uh, and, and it's a, a trunk, it's a, a log probably about 14 inches wide. So. Uh, is that one yeah. piece of wood or is it bolted yeah. to the base? One no, piece. It's, it's one piece. And how does yeah. the tail not break off? <laughs> don't ask me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Just a lot of luck. <laughs> but uh, that one turned out very good. I'm, I'm trying to do several more of them. So. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. What Tom didn't say is he was also it, it, one of the, or he was in the very first Max Sutter relief carving class and, you know, yeah. worked through the projects, but also did some of the other ones. Um, but Tom Rich, I'm going to have you go next, and then Jim Hall, I'll pick you up on the second one, then we'll be, we're getting pretty close to the end. So, Tom Rich. Thank you. Well, I'll introduce myself first. Um, I live in Gresham, which is in East Portland, Oregon. Born and raised here in Portland. I'm a novice um, carver. Um, joined the woodworking group and made boxes. Started off actually making pipes. It's one of the reasons why I was interested in carving. I took a Jeff Harness class on doing little characters. Um, and um, then I, I took this Max Sutter. Those are the two first ones, not really great. Um, that's my diaper. Um, I have Scottish ancestry too. I can't remember who said they were, they had Scottish ancestry, but um, so that's a thistle, which is a national flower. Um, I also uh, took, um, class from Terry. Uh, oh, that's a Max Sutter Rose. Um, and one of the things I learned uh, by that, I didn't, I didn't go deep enough. I didn't um, carve the, the relief as deep as it should. And then I went back and read the book and, and Max Sutter in the book says that he starts by doing, um, by carving the background down at least a half inch. Now that's barely a quarter inch. And, um, and also he stays about at least a 16th away from the line as he's going down so that he can gradually bring that a little bit closer and then do undercuts from there. So that, that's not relieved as far as it probably should have been. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one was, uh, um, I didn't, I didn't, I hadn't read that yet on this one too. This is a sunflower, the Mexican sunflower, which is one of his. Um, and for those, uh, the center of the flower, I used to punch actually a leather punch for, for that um, and read about making the, the punch out of drilling a nail, which um, I didn't actually get to because I found a leather punch that I thought would do it. I, I took a class um, from Rose on, um, um, and I'm not sure Larry's going to show that on on uh, greenwood carving. Uh, oh, this one, I, this is another Rose that I was going to, I started, and then, then I read about the half inch, and so now you can see on the left, I'm really digging out the half inch and going all the way around as far as I can before I do anything in the middle anything on the rows, mm -hmm. on the higher spots. Uh, I probably will do leaves um, and then stems and then the flowers and then the center flower last, the big flower. I thought you were gonna say that's blood on the lower left and you decided to put it aside for a while. I beg your pardon? Oh, it looks like blood on the lower left side of the rows. Oh, no, it's maybe, just, maybe that's just my screen. Probably where, um, where shellac kind of uh, yeah. um, built up when I was I was, I was uh, hardening it. Um, the, Jeff Harness had a class, and the little character on the left is from that class. Um, and the one on the right, um, I, I showed that because I learned something really important, and that's that I can't carve something if I can't draw something. The head is not proportioned correctly. The head is 
you know, the face is too big and the, the head is too small. It should be taller and it should be wider. Um, the features should be, um, you know, the eyes should be in the middle between the chin and the top of the head. Um, so I have taken some uh, self-instruction classes on, on drawing, um, both drawing in perspective and drawing faces. Um, so um, I've, I've come, come to the conclusion I should not carve anything unless I've drawn it in, in, in three dimension before I start carving the wood. Um, see this, this, I took a class from, um, Chuck Reinhardt and, um, he, he started with the donut, which is uh, kind of a preamble to the ripple that we saw earlier. Um, and then, um, just a line carving and, and then, uh, the leaf carving. And, um, in that class, we kind of went in, in those levels. And that, that was what really got me interested in relief carving. And when Larry brought up the Max Sutter class, I wanted to take that so I could learn more about relief carving. Yeah, we're hoping that Chuck will be able to start teaching again. It uh, probably, he's, he's scheduled to go on the Mary May trip with the Grinling Gibbons tour in oh, September, yeah. assuming that's still going on and recover from that, but maybe in October, November. Um, I like Celtic knots. I've been done. I have done several Celtic knots, and that's a box that I made. It's a key caddy actually, and I carved that in the back, and then painted that panel before before the glue up, and then resanded so that the background in the carving stayed painted blue, and but the the foreground um, was stained like the rest of the box. Mm -hmm. And and then I took a class from Rose. And uh, this was in Greenwood carving. And I also do some, a little bit of turning the two items below. The one with the rounded end is a spurtle, which is a Scottish utensil for stirring porridge. And the other utensil is a muddler. But I did the top with the, um, the representation of a thistle um, like the, the um, spurtle. And then I took uh, Terry Burnside's class on um, uh, wood spirits. And this one, you know, I wanted to do a female face. And that's, again, where I decide, but well, I didn't want to show what I had done, because it really was not very good. Um, but if I could draw it, then it's easier for me to carve it. And, and Terry was really good at doing the drawing. And I followed that and, and could come up with these. But I couldn't do a female face until I could draw it first. And then and then put it into, into a carving. So uh, those are things that I've learned as a novice. That's, thanks, for, thanks for sharing. Uh, uh, Jim Hall, I'm gonna have you go through your next round. And then uh, Terry, I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna share, the, I'll uh, share this, not share, I'll, you, you'll, I'll give you control, I'll make you co-host. Now we'll make you co-host, I'll let you share uh, your own screen in a moment. So why don't you queue up your, your PowerPoint and see if it works from your computer. Uh, and then Jim Hall, uh, let's go find, this is the other side of Jim Hall. Besides the, the turning world, he's got multiple dimensions. Almost there. Okay, Jim. Yeah, this is Lisa Maple. Uh, I kind of enjoy doing this sort of thing to see what I can do. Uh, every once in a while, I get a little bit thin, and or the, the wood will. Uh, uh, go all the pot in and of itself, but those are kind of fun. Did that start as a turning, or did it start? As... It's all turning and then cutting with uh, power tools. Okay. Now this is a piece of uh, uh, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, and my wife and I enjoy to a point uh, weaving, and so uh, I wove. We wove. 
a uh, a, oh, a, a um, belt around and uh, tied it down. One of the few people in round that put uh, whoa, uh, these kinds of things on wood. This is a, you're going to have to pronounce the name, Larry. Uh, Monica Setzel. Yes. So Leroy Setzel's daughter. That was the basis of this idea. Well, that, that's, we, that, that's weaving in the middle, Jim. Also. Yes, yes, I wove that. Um, all the rest of it is, is uh, carving, except for the glass. And the in the upper right-hand corner is a piece of, uh, of uh, rose engine work. Yeah. That is a piece of burl. Uh, the thing on the top is a, uh, um, a piece that's hollow, as you can see, and uh, also lots of holes in it. And inside of that is a uh, seahorse. Seahorse, thank you. Yeah. That's sitting inside of it. So that's kind of a complex piece. Um, I've been very careful of late to make those things a little bit thicker. I had uh, some of them uh, explode on me and break up after a couple, three years, believe it or not. So uh, that one I still have. Somebody touch it on my wife and I, I say, hell no, leave it alone. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the next one you saw there is a piece of black walnut. Um, it has some, uh, some turning on the top. And uh, I have a lot of button, uh, not buttons, but holes in there. Some uh, leather stuff that I want around, wound around and around and around. And it works. You got pine, so you got pine needles yes. woven around the top. For the lip. Pine needles. Yeah. And uh, some coil feathers uh, uh, in it. And I unfortunately sold that piece. Uh, I know where it is, but um, I like that piece. Uh, here's a, 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 a another piece of burl. I just kept carved the uh, head on. So anyway, that's a tree from uh, uh, the California coast. I've carved a lot of those and I really like the shape. Yeah. This is from uh, uh, Larry's uh, uh, work. Yes, this is a Max Sutter design. Yes. That, I that, carved that. it and then my daughter painted it. That's a Santa Claus I did a, a good many years ago. Looks like he's <laughs> painting, looks like he's praying. <laughs> Those are some funny pieces I did years ago and uh, been a good time. Those are some pieces I, I carved uh, a few years ago and they, uh, they work quite well. They don't. So you walk around Jim, you walk around Jim's house and you just, and we got some other videos and things we'll, we'll show these some, some more of these later, which is really quite amazing. Not tonight, not tonight. No, not tonight, no, not tonight. Next show until. Um, so, Terry, why don't you see if you can start up your uh, your PowerPoint, and then Tom Willing, I'll have you go next. Okay. After, uh, after Terry. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. 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 Okay. Here we go. Let's see if we can do this. Now, does everybody see a, a slide? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's good. And do you still see it? Like a, sc yep. a screen? <laughs> okay, we're not, good. we're not at the beginning. All right, there we go. Okay, so uh, this is just kind of a random um, survey of some of the work I've done. I, um, 
started in um, 1970 with that little piece on the side, on the left-hand side. It was kind of a cheeky thing that I did. Between school break, I was in my sophomore year at FSU, and by the start of my summer job, I went out by our pool at home and uh, and carved that and, and drank salty dogs for like a week until my job started. The thing on the right I've done just recently, um, I did that for um, a niece. Um, and that's one of the green men that I've done. I've done half a dozen or so green men. I really like those. That was a pretty deep relief. Um, and I tried to undercut that quite a bit. I still could have done more, but I just got tired of carving. So I stopped. <laughs> this is this is a wall or a piece of a wall in my in our basement in the family room. And these are our little wood sketches um, that I've made over the last 30 <clears throat> years, I guess. Um, I started carving because I wanted to some relief from my job, but we camped a lot and being in the woods puts you right next to wood. So um, some of those pieces are, are pretty, pretty far flung. Um, Sitka, Alaska, the Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, on air. Um, a lot of different places. I think I've got a thing in there from the Galapagos. Uh, this I started doing about um, 20 years ago, maybe. Um, the walking sticks on the right are actually some leftovers from um, from my time as a as a craft sales craft show salesman, I guess. Um, and others are ones I've carved much more recently. The three unfinished wood spirits that are white colored um, are ones that I've done for the class I've been teaching in wood spirit carving. Um, the big guy, the tree trunk guy is um, a cottonwood tree that got old and was dying. So I topped it and um, that's in my backyard still in Tallahassee. As far as I know, I left it for the new owners. Didn't mm -hmm. charge an extra dime for it either. And these two guys, I call those the hurricane twins at times. They came out of deadfall from one of our several hurricanes that came through Tallahassee um, over the years. And the little guys on the side are just things that I carved. One of them is cottonwood bark and the other one is um, hmm, maybe a, a piece of a, a cypress knee, I think. These are a collection of green men uh, wow. that I did. Some are from patterns from other people and others I've just drawn and redrawn. Uh, the guy on the on the far right is the with the big nose is um, an oak leaf uh, pattern. Uh, no, excuse me, that's a uh, a grape leaf pattern. And the guy to the left of him, you've seen before, he's uh, he's an oak leaf for sure. And the one next to that is actually a pattern I got that I want to say it maybe it's Laura Irish, but I'm not positive. Um, Man of Elvis, it's a um, Acanthus leaf design. And the one on the far left is a double piece. I have two pieces of wood layered so that um, I, I could have actually done a lot more uh, cutting on the back, but I ran out of energy and patience, so I stopped. These are gnome homes that I've carved from cottonwood bark. These are all cottonwood bark and more kind of wood spirits, um, gnomes, elves, dwarfs. I, I like that kind of thing. I love found wood. I like rough wood. I like to leave pieces of, I love this kind of carving because it's, it's extemporaneous for the most part. And the, and, the, and the thing that you're carving kind of fits the wood and um, it's fun. 
it's a, this is a very relaxing kind of carving for me. Uh, these are odd things that I've made over the years. The guy on the left is a cypress knee from Louisiana and um, just some caricature faces. I carved the sun and the moon for, that was for our house, our home in Tallahassee and we moved it here to Portland. Uh, it's in our dining room. And my latest grandson is, is named Theo Moon Conrad. So he loves the moon. Uh, a little Santa I carved for a, a sister-in-law. Uh, I carved a bunch of shelf elves and that's the, the, the thing with the hat covering its eyes um, and, <laughs> and sold them in craft fairs. People, people like those. They're nice little affordable things and they're easy to carve. Um, the uh, walrus and the rabbit are from Alice in Wonderland and I carved those for my daughters when they were in a Alice in Wonderland play years ago. And I think on the far, far right, I carved for a, uh, a high school class reunion. We were the Pasco High School Pirates. By the way, my name, Terry, uh, came from Terry and the Pirates. My, my mom loved that comic. And uh, odd place to get a name, but uh, that's me. Um, uh, and this, I carved, have carved um, a bunch of crushes over the years. And these are three different styles. Uh, one of them is a little more realistic, kind of um, uh, almost uh, Nordic or, or German kind of kind of carving. Um, the, the one on the top, the one on the lower left is from um, Sean Zippa. Uh, that's his design, and I love that. I just I love the, the stylized figures. And then the one on the lower right, I carved most of it when I got here and made the little three sisters. Um, mountains to put the pieces on. And those are definitely folksy, um, a folksy crash. So that's just um, a little bit of what I've done over the last uh, 50 years in carving. By the way, that first carving, which was 50 years ago, I had at least a 20 year hiatus where I didn't carve a single thing or I was actually working, finding a job and starting a family. Um, so that's my stuff. Okay, thank you, Terry. Yes, sir. See if I can stop sharing here. There we go. I'll give it back to okay. you. So, Tom Willing, I'm ready to queue you up. Are you ready? Tom, are you yeah, still here? Yeah. Okay, hang on just a second. Why don't you introduce yourself, and then I'll while you're talking, I'll I'll queue your slides up. Um, my name is Tom Willing, and I'm primarily a wood turner, although I've built a lot of furniture in my time. And uh, I feel like I can sort of uh, rarify company with all you guys. And I hope you aren't too disheartened by the level of inspiration that's showing here, because um, it's really a lot higher than the results I've been getting so far. But um, I've had a great time with Larry's class. You can see from these last um, I decided that maybe it was time since I inherited a set of uh, pretty nice old English carving tools to uh, start, out and start using them. So uh, here I am. I had the most fun I think I've had is with that center medallion with a six petal flower. That was a lot of fun to do. I thank Larry for being an inspiring teacher. Uh, you'll see that I, uh, I'll, I'll go way back to the early beginning, early days. Um, my first uh, real part I did on my thumb with a pocket knife. I was pretty much of a young kid at that point. And like Terry, I had some uh, long hiatuses in there in between. I started interested in surface ornamentation when I spent a day in a craft fair at the uh, Calvin Syrian Church. And there's a Leroy Cecil piece in the foyer there. And I really studied that piece as I sat there and talked to people looking over the And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to have to do some of that somewhere sometime. That was about 10 years ago. And 
Uh, oh, so I'm trying to mute, figure out who to mute, folks. Hang on just a second. <laughs> That's the problem with running with running long. We have people that uh, mute Ray Curtis. Ray Curtis, thank you. I'm trying to figure it out. I got to find him. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my father was a marine biologist, and so things like crinoids and all those guys sort of. Uh, fascinated me at one point and combining that theme with the more linear geometric stuff that you get off a lathe and off of uh, a saw uh, worked their way together and that was where this piece came from. Uh, just a lot of fun with surface texture on that one. Took a, a gouge and uh, just dimpled the surface of all the saw cuts so that they weren't chainsaw cuts. And then of course throwing in the eggs that was a fun piece to do. This piece you can see, uh, I use it sometimes to illustrate the importance of stopping soon enough. And I inadvertently stopped where I stopped on this piece and then realized where I'd stopped. And that uh, gnome, is, the tree did that all on its own. And so you can see his face looking out at you from the upper left corner of the bowl. And then did I send you the flip side of that one? I did. This, uh, this is one of my first uh, efforts at relief carving. And boy, was that tricky with that burl. It was a lot of work, but I uh, turned out OK, and I enjoyed doing it. So it was well worth it. Was that hand tools, Tom, or yes. power hand tools? Yeah, well, lathe. Lathe is lathe. a wonderful glorified carving machine, but uh, the rosette is done by hand. OK. Again, another combination of lathe and hand tools. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about turning is how the interplay of form and light and shadow uh, goes. And then, uh, especially with this piece I discovered, as you can see in the middle there, that little ridge uh, sort of plays off of that fascination of mine. I really enjoyed making this piece. Another one. Uh, I did all the smooth stuff with the lathe, but uh, somewhere, I'm not sure if I gave you a picture of the bottom of this one or not. Oh yes, I did, good. Uh, that's all texture. Uh, I got my gouges as sharp as I could get them and there's no abrasive on the uh, tool cuts in that piece, except for the lathe. Uh, spent a couple of weeks in Italy and uh, was fascinated by the Tuscan bridges. And then this piece all played off of that theme. And I think I sent a picture of it in its entirety too. Uh, that's the bottom on, in process. Um, there's the whole piece. You can see the fluting. It looks a little bit like an oil drilling bit, but then it has three feet and the uh, blossoms are all studies in form that I did on the lathe. Super. Thank you, Tom. That was great. Uh, I'm going to show, I don't think Brian Goat is here. I don't see his name. Brian, if you're here, could you unmute yourself and let me know? Brian is someone that Jerry Boone met in Mesa, Arizona. He lives in Tacoma, spends part time in Mesa, and he's a, a beginning woodworker. And I want to show you what beginning woodworkers do if you have talent, which I don't. Oops, here we go. So Brian did a series. I'm going to step you through. This is looking down on the top of a tray. I feel come back to that. So there's several views of this project. And to me, what's really interesting, and Brian, again, I'm speaking for you, assuming you're not here, is how do you even think of this stuff? Now, maybe he found it in a book, but I don't know. Um, even to think of it, let alone to carve it, becomes an interesting a challenge. So here is a tray with all these objects on it. I don't know for sure. I think they're 
I, I, I don't know if they're... We, we don't or, see it, Larry. We just see you. Don't you? Thank you. Um, nobody told me my zipper's open. Hang on. Okay, can you see that? Do you see a tray? Yes. You see the guy holding his head? <laughs> Do you see that? Do you see the head, the head being held in the hands? Yeah. yeah. So this is the one I was commenting on, to even to think about how you design that. Um, I don't know, I assume he's reading a book. Larry, um, if you don't, maybe maybe I can talk a little bit about Please, this yeah, carving. Thank you, Drew. Thank yeah, because I, I I know Brian, and um, not so much this one here, but can we go back to the tray? Uh, it'll come up right there. That one. Right. Okay. Now, let me emphasize it. This is honest to God. This is the second carving Brian ever did. Um. And yeah, he's, he's, he's tremendously creative. He's, he's so much fun to work with and to be around. But what you're looking at there is, is one piece of wood. It's not different carvings that are all mounted on a base. He, he basically got a piece of basically you know 12 inches long by maybe eight inches wide by five or six inches deep basswood and had this vision and just started working down on it. Took him quite a bit of time to do it, um, and you know he had a couple problems. Obviously, there, there was some issue with the glasses; it was very, very weak. But um, you know, it's just you know it's it's a tremendous piece of work for for a guy who was just starting out. Uh, this one here, I think, is probably his third or fourth carving that he's done. Um, I, you know, I, I, I work with Brian. He's, he does a lot of his carving down there in Arizona. So, you know, we get together quite a bit as he has problems, but, um, you know, tremendously, tremendously creative. Uh, this one, this one he calls pouring your heart out. This one I don't know an awful lot about. It was a, a fairly basic one for him, and he just kind of did this one on his own. He he didn't need any help on it, so I didn't offer it. He didn't ask. Well, Brian was the one that signed up for the Max Sutter class, and he just whipped through these these projects. I said most people don't have time to finish them, but I think he finished them, and he went beyond the first three and started doing some more of the. Um, the other ones and just did them on his own. So that's that's Brian's work. We got two more to go, and then we're going to quit. I got. I'm going to show you a few of mine. I'm humbled, and I don't think of myself as being worthy of showing this stuff, but I'll show you what I'm doing anyway. And then I'm going to finish with a video, a three-minute video that Jim Spister did. Jim is traveling and was not able to be here. Um, tonight, but he, he walked through his house and did some, um, did some videos and then I stitched them together. Can you see a bowl? Can you see a, does that show up? Roman, yeah, okay. I say that is an excellent image. So, um, but I discovered uh, photography and lighting does make a quite a bit of difference. So Jim, this is the bowl that we've been showing on Monday mornings. Like this got like five coats on it. I, this is masa. This is an out, outcome. This is butternut. Uh, it's an outgrowth of masa and a tiny Japanese bowl making class that several of us here present tonight took. A uh, mixture of hand and table saw and some power carving. But the stippling and the banding came right out of uh, Jim Hall's inspiration. And the rounding uh, was suggested by um, 
by Massa. This is a piece that came out of Chuck Reinhardt's two classes. One was a borders class and one was a uh, lettering class. So I combine them into one piece to hang up my exercise clothes. It's about three feet long, maybe eight feet high. It's a repetitive border with five cycles uh, using a router to clean out the background and then hand carved the, the rest of the, uh, the rep repetitive patterns. And then I carved the, uh, the hand, head and heart art symbol, which was a class uh, exercise chosen by the students in the class to, uh, to St. Francis of Assisi quote from like 1272 that says something like, if you work with your hands, you're a laborer. If you work with your head, you're a craftsman. If you work with your heart, you're an artist. So it's the combination of how do you get all, all three of those together. Uh, this is the very first thing I did with Chuck. He did a variation of line drawing as an introduction to V-tools and, and uh, veiners. This is Cortison White Oak. Uh, using a pattern that came out of a, one of his old books. And I just like the way it works and I just keep it around my office. I like things Japanese and I did a couple courses on Japanese woodblock printing. And the output is that lower left print, which is made with a combination of four different ink blocks, but one of the, one of the patterns had two different ink colors on it. So the upper right block, which is hand carved, that little red spot is actually the lips that are then applied to the, the woodblock printing. And uh, I wanted to see how fine I could make the hair. This is not my design. It came out of one of the, the master, just a segment of the masters. And what's really humbling is you realize that, you know, 200 years ago, they had 20 such blocks creating such fine work that was just staggering. I discovered this process, I could also uh, make really simple forms and then emboss it by using thick paper with a uh, hydraulic press. You can reverse the image and then press the paper into the form, much like you would do a cookie, a cookie cutter. So my daughter's name was Lisa. I, the top two, I had the form and the card, so I did a happy birthday, Lisa. Um, and the bottom one was a generic happy something. And I thought I would just do the basic form, make a bunch of them, which I never did, and then put a, and then separately embossed birthday, Mother's Day, graduation, whatever. So that's my, that's my play thing. So I'll stop there. And then finally, let me show Jim Spitzer. Jim, Jim is an interesting guy. He's a neighbor of mine, lives about a mile away. And he was the guy that didn't know whether he liked carving or not. Um, he got, I think he got hooked on Mary May's um, class that we had here about two years ago. And there was a bunch of accidental things that were happening um, in and around that, which I'll, I can explain later. Let me start the video up, hang on a minute, just a minute. So there will be audio on this. And if I'm lucky, I'm gonna share the sound on my computer. And when I'm, you should hear sound as well as, you should hear him narrating as we go along. So let's go see if this works. Uh, Jerry Boone, I'm looking at your picture. As I started, would you tell me, shake your head if you hear the, hear the audio. Hello, Garbers. This is the, a summary of the work of Jim Spitzer in, the, in his carving journey. No, I've been we see about five years. Your browser it started with taking some Mary May courses and some Chuck Reinhardt courses, and then. So Roman, what do you see? A browser with a Zoom tab. Is it techy? We hear the audio, but there's some sort of an ad for Zoom. Really? As a video. Okay, well, let me try that again. Let me go see what happens here. Just 
I think I was sharing the wrong screen. Hang on. That looks so good do you, now. Do you see a table saw with a bunch of things on it? Yep. Okay. Let me start it up and we'll see. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Good day, fellow carvers. This is the, a summary of the work of Jim Spitzer in, the, in his carving journey. I've been on it for about five years. And it all started with taking some Mary May courses and some Chuck Reinhardt courses. And then I took a series, of, made a series of projects when... So I just pause it. Jerry, can you hear the audio okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Larry Wade uh, taught the Max Sutter courses this past winter. And I'm going to go throughout the rest of the house and show you some of my other work. I'm pretty sure it was a Mary, uh, Chuck Reinhardt course where I carved these numbers and we were all able to do original work, house numbers. And then I had to get original and work on more difficult woods. This piece is uh, inspired by a trip to the coast and the wood is Claro Walnut or Oregon Walnut. Beautiful wood, lots of color variation in it. And with the leftover wood from that coastal wave project, I made this deep relief tree, also Clara Walnut of the same piece. A couple of years ago, I took a bowl carving class from Masa Natani at the Guild. And here's a bowl that I carved. I wanted to make every bowl something that looked like it was obvious it could not be done by a lathe. This again is Clara Walnut. And then I continued my bowl carving journey with another bowl. Again, making sure it could not be carved by a lathe. And I'm really proud of this one, probably my favorite. The previous one I showed you looked a little bit too much cer ceremonial in nature. And in the center is another Sets Oil inspired work, about three and a half feet tall. And it's again a piece of scrap wood from a construction site. And uh, I think it's probably Doug Fir. Quite challenging and fun to do during my big carving winter two winters ago. And then I took a short session uh, by Terry Burnside and carving wood spirits. And so here's my wood spirit and that inspired something much bigger. I discovered this book on Wood Spirits and Green Men by Laura Irish with Chris Pye at Woodcrafters. And so I had to make this deep relief uh, green man out of Clara Walnut. And it's about almost three inches thick. And uh, took a lot of work. If I got paid 50 cents an hour, I might have to sell it for $2,000. Exaggeration. Okay, that is, I think, did I miss anybody? I think that is it, folks. So we have some brave souls that stuck with us for the entire two hours. I thank you for that. And I, I don't want to cut it off because there may be some questions. So obviously, if you have to leave, feel free to leave. But I also want to provide any opportunity if you have questions of any, to anybody. Um, now, now is the time. Enjoyed the clap. Thank you. Yeah, I might just mention uh, Max Sutter's patterns that everybody has been carving or a lot of people had carved. I joined Western Wood Carvers in 1983, and that was a required class by Dick Salmon. And uh, so anybody that joined the club at that time had to, if they wanted to take a, class, a carving class, that's what they had to do. Uh, there was about three patterns I kept seeing. And, uh, and I even have a couple of them. My problem was I didn't want to do relief carving. I wanted to be a three-dimensional caricature carver. So I quit. And um, 
and then in 1995 I joined again and and uh, took um, some uh, caricature uh, carving classes uh, from different people and but uh, and when when I rejoined Dave Dieselbrett who is a uh, carving instructor from Salem was uh, doing golf balls carving golf balls and I got intrigued with that so I started carving golf balls and then at the show. Uh, our tables were about three tables apart and people kept buying his and, and laughing at mine and I didn't I didn't know how to take that but so but um, at any rate those uh, Max Sutter carvings were required if you joined Western Car Wood Carvers back then and I just wanted to mention that. Thank you Tony thank you. <laughs> I forgot to look at the chat so uh, let's see if, if Tom is still here um, Bundy, uh, the question was, what, what wood did you use for the, uh, the seahorse? Do you remember? It, it was gray pine. Gray the local, pine. It just gray, the native wood trees around here. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Not gray pine, late. gray pine. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, I think Leif is gone. But how do you draw the pattern on the slab or uh, do you make it up as you work? Uh, here, Larry. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah. Sorry. No, I, I, yeah, I, I uh, use a forty-six-year-old circular saw to do, uh, to cut the grid, uh, and then I just uh, organically you conjure up the designs as I go, square by square. So it's not an overall design; it's really a piece by piece to to achieve balance and rhythm to the piece. So. So it is a very organic kind of uh, uh, function. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the class, Larry. Did you ever try the coin and the thumb? No, I didn't. Uh, you know, thank you for. I just saw your chat thing. So I'm gonna. I'll put that in the in the July newsletter, Yvonne. I forgot to put that in. I haven't tried it. This is a. Do you want to do you want to describe the trick? Can it be done verbally? Oh yeah. No, it was just, I took a, um, a carbon class and they mentioned to um, drop like for men, maybe a quarter in the inside of your thumb guard between, you know, your, uh, between the guard and your thumb or a, a lady, I use a dime or a nickel and it just extra protection. And you actually, when you're carving, you don't feel it at all. So Yvonne does a lot of caricature carving. So this is an extra level of protection inside a vet wrap or inside a, a thumb guard of your choice to provide that absolute barrier between the sharp edge and your, and your skin. One question, any question? Everybody wanna go home? Oh, you're our home. Uh, Roman, what was your uh, um, email or what are uh, your uh, site that you have your work on? Your email, not email, what is it, ULR? Well, Thank you for asking. I will post it in the chat. And you can all, Al, you can also see it in the, in the last newsletter. Well, in, I think in the last or the recent newsletter is read, readandtry.com, I think. But, uh, Roman's contributed a couple of articles with his uh, his uh, web website there. I want to thank everybody for doing this. This is and for hanging out. You know, there's a to me the world of carving is just so infinitely varied. It's just you know like tonight I think is an illustration of that. And we and we haven't even touched all the nooks and crannies. You know. Uh, besides carving wood, there's carving other materials. Um, stone or soapstone or ice or carrots or whatever and then there's golf balls and you know we don't have some clubs are very heavily caricature oriented and we really don't have a lot of caricature carvers at least that i know of in amongst our in our midst but in salem in the capital carvers there's a lot and i'm pretty sure there's a lot in the coastal carvers where kathy is from in lincoln city and in the Boise Club, I hang out with occasionally. There's, there's a lot of, uh, there's, I think they have three caricature carver, carvers of America members 
there. So it's, uh, you know, we just have an incredible diversity. Um, so I'm hoping, I assume we'll do more show and tells in the future. This seems like maybe twice a year, or at least maybe even sometimes parts of each meeting, we could do some more. Uh, the Turners have extraordinary um, systems set up where they do a lot of show and tell every, every single meeting. And the photography is there and the, there's a lot of work, a lot of output. So thank you for your support. Thank you for showing up. Uh, if you can make the picnic, great. And if you can't, uh, the next online Zoom thing will be in September. We'll hopefully, hopefully see you there. If you have any feedback about tonight, don't be shy. You know, this is, as I told my wife, this is both dress rehearsal and opening night when you do one of these programs. So, you know, we're not gonna, we, don't, we'll, we will repeat it or parts of it in the future. So any way we can figure out how to improve it, uh, we, wanna, we wanna do that. I appreciate your help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you.